Welcome to the Almost Perfect Podcast, a celebration of fuck-ups, failures, and falling flat on your face. This is a podcast that believes you can learn from experience, but that experience doesn't have to be your own. Ha, I'm but perfect and I'm a functional fucker. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes. And today we are learning from Spook Matumbo, aka Ntato Mojata, who is a musician, a filmmaker, a journalist, and a historian of sorts. But he's also one of my all-time favorite artists, uh, definitely one of my all-time favorite musicians, and someone who I think has been incredibly important. Uh, to the South African music scene over the years, especially with his documentary Future Sound of Mzanzi that I think is still really important and something you should check out. But personally, I heard Spook uh, for the first time on the Fantastic Kill when I was in my early 20s. And ever since then, I have kept uh, track of what he's doing. I really loved the Machine Warm. Um, I loved, I love all those fucking collaborative projects, man. I've actually still got, uh, the Sweat X EP slash album on my computer, which was not a thing that was very widely distributed, but yeah, something I still play from time to time and fucking love Phantasma. Phantasma even played my birthday party once, which is still fucking crazy to me, but it's, you know, it, it, everything just lined up correctly for that to happen. I was throwing the party it was a cross dress the universe party so you had to basically <laughs> cross dress in space and i think that was quite a fun little theme that we had going on but their management or their booking agent hit me up because he saw the gig was happening phantasma wanted to tour and i'd managed to secure a little bit of money from jaegermeister so i was like yeah let's do that i got 20k from them and basically all of that money was spent on <laughs> flats and accommodation and yeah paying the band a bit of money which isn't a lot and that's something i'll always be grateful for and something i'll always respect is that you know they actually were willing to to try and make the band work they were willing to do these gigs and get in front of people and that's still one of my favorite nights i've ever had in my entire life so yeah we, we chat a little bit about that uh, towards the end and yeah man like i say it's just for me this was a big deal and maybe a little bit too big a deal because to be honest with you i was not on my best game here like i think i did too much research i think i went into with too many things that like i particularly wanted to discuss and wasn't necessarily as present as i should have been there were also like technical issues in the beginning you might hear like a weird cut or two uh because yeah my sound just cut out at one point and that was a whole fucking mess and then at the end it just cuts out because of the fucking platform i was using didn't upload all of spook's uh <laughs> chat so yeah there were there were a few hiccups and technical issues and stuff like that but yeah, I was trying to steer the conversation in one way, Spook was trying to steer it in another. And, you know, there was a little bit of a disconnect from time to time. But he shares so much dope shit, and I feel like for the most part, I just got out of the way and let him talk. And it was enlightening as fuck. So yeah, you're gonna you're gonna get quite a quite an interesting chat. A lot of history. A lot of fucking history. And some very reasonable and actionable advice so that's coming up in just a little bit of course i need to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by you uh, which means you can support it by going to patreon.com forward slash almost perfect or you can go over to the almost perfect website which is almost perfect.co.za you can buy some merch you can scan the zapper there throw in a few shekels into the into the kitty and uh, help keep this thing going because yeah i've got i've got tight pants and big plans man <laughs> in the, yeah this year i want to start doing a few more of these chats you know a few more of the people who really influenced me growing up and even you know not just growing up even recently there's been a few artists who i really admire for some reason though they their management and uh, them themselves don't always uh, reply but 
hey, what can you do, man? Like, you know, go where you're wanted, I guess. And so I'm going to keep reaching out. So I actually reached out to Jimmy Carr's management the other day because he's coming to South Africa. And they got back to me uh, saying he was unavailable. But, you know, you, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And sometimes you also miss the shots you do take. But every now and again, you know, everyone now and again, the, the puck sneaks in. And, you know, goalkeepers are fucking big. Like, especially in ice hockey where the goals are small. So <laughs> I'm not going to beat myself too much if uh, I miss every now and again as long as I keep shooting. But that's all I've got for you for now. I'll catch up with you at the end. Here it comes. It's the Almost Perfect Podcast with Spook Matumbo. So how are you living, Spook? Or should I say Ntato? What's what's the name these days? Ntato's good. Spook Matumbo's good. It's all good. Yeah, man, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on, Bob. How are you living? How are you doing, man? Yeah, not too shabby. Like, had a weird vibe, like, in December, just, you know, the world was getting to me a bit. But um, I'm back in a good headspace, and I'm looking forward to trying to do some dope shit this year. So, yeah, you've been involved in quite a big project recently. It's an anthology of African stories and that are animated called Kazazi Moto. How did that come about? Well, the project in general, Kazazi Moto, came about from Triggerfish, the animation studio in Cape Town. Oh, yeah, they've done some pretty good work. Yeah, yeah. And I think in the past, it was kind of really um, just about animals in Africa, like yeah. dolphins and uh, wildebeest and stuff. So it was important for them to do something about the people of the continent that's so populous. And they somehow got a relationship with Disney and yeah, they, they asked a whole bunch of people to pitch stories. I don't know, like a um, hundred people, there's lots of teams and it was very competitive pitching stories. And I think this was probably a while ago because I did see that you wrote it with Pomlani. So how this process is obviously taking some time. Yeah. Worked on it with Pomlani Piccoli. The process took uh, like, two and a half or three years okay and uh worked worked on it with director terence neal worked on it with catherine green mainly it was me and catherine and then pomlani was involved at a stage of writing and then we had to like keep rewriting and rewriting so it was a very long arduous process <laughs> yeah getting stuff to film can take quite some time but what was it like working with pomlani at that time because i know he was looking to get more into film before he passed away oh it was it was cool it was really beautiful it was off the back of some video work he was introducing us to the um, what is it, VR stuff? Oh, snap, yeah, yeah. VR stuff, and 360 camera stuff. And so he directed a kind of video for the group I was working on, Batu. And through that, we had dinner there, and then we spoke, and yeah, asked him to come on board for Surf Summer. Oh, snap. So you didn't know him that long. You just uh, met him through other projects and then decided, damn, let's work with this dude. No, no. Or did you know no, him for no, years? No, no. no, no. Yeah, yeah, I've known him since like 2000 and whew, back in there. Yeah, because I know he was like on the scene in Joburg for quite a while. No, not even about the scene. I knew when he was in high school, like 2000. Oh, damn. Like long ago. Okay, so your careers like went alongside each other basically. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 we were buddies from a long time ago. You know, his brother, Lusolom Zipikot, Fuzzy Slippers, the illustrator. I really don't, but I'm going to check him out now. Yeah, Lissolom Di Picol is an amazing illustrator. You should check him. And there's an artist called Nolan Dennis. So they all came up as kind of a crew of friends. Even the guy who was in um, PH Fat, the guy called Mark. Mark. Yeah, yeah, I still need to chat to him. Mark was also, they're all from Pretoria. So when they were in high school... Um, and I had just finished high school. I'm a bit older than them. I just finished high school and we linked up, we made some music. Yeah. Oh, snap. I know like a bit about your history because I watched your TED talk <laughs> earlier today. I, so I think that's like 2003 or something. 
Yeah. I know you've uh, I know you've evolved a lot, a hell of a lot over the years, but and the cool thing about it was I got to find out, you know, you do come from like a musical family, but it's one of the interesting things mm-hmm. I found was that change that happened when you moved from Soweto to Santon and you mm-hmm. found yourself being a lot lonelier. Could you talk me through that a bit? Um, what is there to say? <laughs> Just moving from, uh, moving from a place that's really, there's a lot of people to move from a place that doesn't move from a place that's quite friendly and communal to moving to a place that's quite hostile. Yeah. Moving to a place that feels quite safe to moving to a place that's like, doesn't feel safe and is quite paranoid. So it's just a different feeling. But I imagine like that's had quite an effect on your art over time. Like that juxtaposition of life essentially and having experienced different aspects of both. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But I guess uh, in the same way it has everybody in South Africa, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. <laughs> like, but that's one of the things I find with your work is that it does just represent like what it's really like to be in South Africa sometimes. You know, like I've connected with your stuff since I was quite young. Like I still remember hearing you on the Fantastic Kill for the first time and then being like, damn, who is this guy? But then even when you're late to work and stuff, you still talk about stuff like campus rape. You know, you've got that anatomy of a campus rape riot. You talk about politics. You talk about all these different things amongst like these dope beats and like songs that you can really fucking dance to. And like, I do find that that's obviously like a core of South African art sometimes. And you seem to embody it quite nicely. Yeah. That a question. Yeah. It's not. It's, we're having a conversation. <laughs> yeah. We're having a conversation. Yeah. Know. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it. what you're saying and the way you're saying, it seems like that is the natural thing to do. You know what I mean? I've done all, I've done the um, vacuous, absolutely meaningless, um, hyper capitalist, uh, hyper consumerist, meaningless, meaningless work as well Have you, okay i didn't realize that like yeah. what, what sort of stuff you're talking about there quite a fair share my son like too too much the point that i'm trying to make is that that is the need for balance you know when you find yourself in a heap of just bullshit you find the need to like okay you have to say you have to say something about this you have to say something about that but it's also i guess the the kind of hip hop that I grew up on and the kind of albums that I grew up liking meant that things have to be a bit topical. Yeah. There's, there's one side that is uh, maybe later abstract, you know, and just every song can be like every song. But I think the core of when I was six years old, seven years old, eight years old, and those first albums that I dug, a lot of them were like themes on each different song and a very strong theme, such strong themes that, you know, something could not even be a song. It can be an interlude, but it'll still be such a strong theme. So I think it's to be, um, yeah, thematic and not as meaningless or vacuous. That's dope. And I would, I feel like that's how, like you've kind of approached all your projects, even like looking back to Machine Wam, but I assume like the song control kind of puts you on the map and that, I think also comes from that juxtaposition that you had of like, you know, being a bit lonelier when you were a teenager and stuff and like listening to stuff, I would assume like joy division whilst mixing it in with more local sounds. So I don't, once again, I don't really know what the question is, but how did you come up with control? I guess. Cause for me, like that was also like a step up that I saw, you know, cause you know, I was here in Durban. I didn't necessarily know everything that was going on, but that was another thing of yours that I was just like, holy fuck. Yeah, that was, I think that's like from 2008, trying to work on a, pretty much discovering South African electronic music and being so excited and psyched. At some point, I went on a trip with with Wadi, with Wadkin Tudor Jones from yeah. the Antwerp. And we went to Belgium and like I went out on some other mission and met some people and just kind of had the, the party time. But in the club, I had this massive, crazy realization that 
whoa, South African electronic music is the best in the world, that I've just listened to 12 hours of a big variety of stuff, but it's absolute bullshit. We've got (laughs) such exciting stuff at home. I had this wash of excitement that at home I had absolutely taken for granted. And to be honest, my taste and my interest was outside because, you know, South African stuff was everywhere. So it was whatever. And it took for me to be outside to realize that, oh, shit, what's happening at home is actually really unique, special, and banging. Like I had to stand there for those 12 hours. And just be bored. uh, Yeah, I'm not bored like that. I was trying to to, um, get over on a young lady. So I couldn't be. So I couldn't. I couldn't be bored. I had to. That's the thing. I had to pretend like I was having fun. So I was actually paying attention to what's going on, on a certain level. You know. Okay, that's quite a interesting um, origin story, I guess. Oh no, no, yeah. So, so then uh, come back home, working on stuff. Started group with Richard Romney. Um, yeah, Richard the Third. Yeah, I fucking love that dude. <laughs> Moleke Mbembe. That's the group that we started with him. And the idea was to, we were doing um, an idea like a mixtape, like a a freezy internet, MySpacey mixtapey thing that we put on Mediafire or whatever. And it would be versions of foreign songs in a South African electronic style. Okay. So that's so it was part of a project that had like Suicide Speed Racer, had like um, some South African 80s synth, synth pop stuff um, that we redid. But then Control was one of the songs. Then, then I released an album and put it on there as well. And, then, and who did the visuals again? Because that was also quite striking and I think what helped boost it internationally. Yeah, like crazy. It was. Um, it was a couple of people. It was the photographer, DOP, Michael Cleary. It was the artist, great artist, master, Peter Hugo. Oh, shit. Okay. And it was, yeah. Damn. Okay. How did you come to work with fucking Peter Hugo? That's a crazy story. It was uh, in this craze of kind of rediscovering South African. I don't know. Just, just a real excitement. With the, with the South African music. And also, I'd been collecting music from really young. Yeah. And pr- price point and pricing was always an issue. You know, to get foreign stuff means like import. Means some things can go up to 200 rand, 250, 300 rand. Oh, I remember stuff. that. Look and listen days and shit. Then, yeah. But the flip side was a lot of the South African stuff. There was this place um, uh, yeah. I'm giving you uh, like old man memory. Sorry, <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> there was a, there's there's one of the music shops that isn't uh, like what in- incredible music. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was no, a music no, warehouse no. or one of those? No, that's no. what I'm saying. Oh, there's another else. one. There's another one that shut down, but it came up and shut down. But its whole thing was that it wasn't as snooty about um, what it distributed. Okay. So it took from a lot of independent labels across the country and pushed and supported a lot of stuff. It wasn't as turn away. So a lot of stuff was in there from a lot of spots and you could get like the most localized, regional, from unpolished to more polished to mid-polished CDs for really cheap, like um, 10 Rand, 20 Rand, 15 Rand, oh, sure. 30 Rand. Some stuff is double CDs. So it was like, just like a really beautiful golden age that as a music collector all my life, this was like sweet. DJ, DJ, DJ fucking knifey, DJ cabbage, you know, DJ record. So a lot of, a lot of Pretoria stuff, a lot of Limboko stuff, a lot of Nelspread stuff, a lot of Kwazulu stuff, a lot of Mpumalanga stuff, some Eastern Cape stuff, just. Yeah, a real trove of electronic music. And this is just before, before Kasi MP3, you know, just before a lot of stuff got uploaded. So things were still really on CD if you wanted it. 
if you wanted this obscure track from some guy in some, you know, rural place who's making the most banging electronic music, you'd have to have it from the CD that is printed. Yeah, I was out of touch with that stuff, but I was like in the punk scene and that, and you would often find you know one person spared spreading around a cd and everyone just ripping that cd if like like that was just the way like music got spread was just through sharing and through like someone being told like i know there were merch tables for us and that but it was like a very different way to get music but then you're talking about stuff like cassie mp3 i know like oh no sorry 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 i, I messed up there is definitely they were spreading through um Bluetoothing stuff, people were sharing, people were copying stuff, and there was still all the. You remember when Taxi Rank would sell the the MP3 CDs with like hundreds of songs? So there was also there was also yeah. that happening at the same time. <laughs> so there was just a flood of music in the pre-streaming time. So what I wanted to get into from that was basically. You like is in the uh, future sound of Mzanzi. I think one of the things that comes through there was how digital distribution really helps a lot of local acts find an audience overseas because they weren't necessarily being appreciated here or couldn't get on radio, couldn't get into these spaces, you know, like here where you could actually really be heard. And it was stuff like, you know, CDs, MP3s, or. I, I think it's the. It's shaky to say they weren't appreciated here. They were appreciated here, just maybe not on a large scale. But things were had things were really strong local, that's, that's essentially localized, what I mean. powerful scenes where people were local celebrities in their neighborhoods on the yeah. street and in there. Like I went to some, I went to this place, Platfontein in um, in the Northern Cape near Kimberley, like an hour and a bit outside of Kimberley, and it's uh, it's like. Uh, on one side, they've got a traditional Khoisan village where they present and then act, and then on the other side is township, Bloodfontein. And they were moved from close to Namibia, Botswana, as a whole community by the SADF. Okay. They were moved, like, I think in the late 80s, early 90s. So it's a whole community, you know. I think it's a San community specific. Then in that community, yeah. they had an elect, they had a banging producer. And this place is like isolated Khoisan <laughs> area, but has a Kasi as well. And they have their like banging house producer. But it was really just all over the spot. So what I wanted to get into from that though was then there was this like international explosion where Europe was basically looking to Sorry, South sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. And, I guess I was contesting you know, a lot of artists got the idea that they didn't have exposure. They didn't have the exposure that meant that they're known all around world all around the country exactly. i mean like mainstream exposure. but that is quite different from yeah. from um, other things like i guess and you tell me in something like punk with a group people can be local celebrities in the same way obviously oh 100 percent. and the scene like so i was part of the punk and hardcore scene and we definitely had like bands that we loved and you know you had all their stuff and like you would go watch them when they would tour and stuff like that but the rest of the country would definitely if you weren't into that kind of music no one would fucking know what it was like some bands would get through to radio and that but they wouldn't necessarily be the ones that you know you wanted to listen to i i, I get what you're saying then that like you know you do have your micro scenes essentially no, i guess i'm not even talking about micro scenes because on one side it's the clubs and it's the scenes on the other side in what in bloodfontein i'm talking about like daylight there's an old lady over there there's a goat over there there's a little child over there you know the speakers blaring that's not a scene that's a community you know that's just life that's just like no the person is big in the area they're the only producer in the area and they're big well, what actually do you think causes that? Is that just access to, like, not instruments or whatever, but something like it's, a laptop? It's what, you, it's what you're, it's exactly, I think, what you stepped on and then stepped away from when you said instrument is that in the past, in the past, okay. society would have that function fulfilled by, you know, whatever kinds of instrumentalists or singers or, you know, speakers or griots. But now this person has the software, has this hardware, and still fulfills the same function. Yeah, that's interesting. 
what we like one of the things I was saying that's highlighted by Future Sound of Mzanzi was then how a lot of this music that was big in its own right, like in its own spaces, but wasn't something that everyone in the country knew, was then being exported overseas. And what do you think the long-term effects of that turned out to be? Because I know at the time there was always the arguments about like culture vultures and people stealing stuff, but at the same time, quite a few people did manage to get paid and make careers, you know, out of going to Europe. And I think a lot of people still look that way if they are. You know what was interesting? Like, <laughs> I should start talking. Like, you know what was interesting about that time? <laughs> I just want to stop doing that. What was really interesting about that time was that. A lot of people had no interest in going to Europe. A lot of people okay. were, the scene here was so self-sufficient. So it was so self-sufficient, was so self-contained. And people, some people were so fully booked that they didn't even need to go. Like there's a famous story that I saw from one side. Um, you know, this, I don't know, you know, this, there's this French guy, Techie Latex. TTC. He's been here before, hasn't he? Or yeah, no? take it, take it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he was trying to get, I think I'm right that it was him. He was trying to get um, Cleo. This is when Cleo was just smashing it. Like, off, okay. As far as um, beats, electronic beats and doing a variety of stuff and just bringing out album after album after album of like bangers. And bangers in the sense that like I was starting to travel and I was playing them in clubs all over the world and they would just work on system. They would just work with different audiences and they weren't in any way um, structured or sounding like anything from that side. It was rhythmically different. It was sonically different. It was stylistically different, but it would bang and it would get people really hyped up on the dance floor. And, um, his vibe with the booking that they offered him wasn't a big money booking. Um, it was the kind of bookings that we were taking. It was the kind of booking that people who were on that circuit were taking, but it wasn't a big money booking for South Africa's top artists. You know? And he told them to kind of feck off. <laughs> he told them, no thanks, keep your Europe, keep your Paris, like I'm not interested, my schedule's full. And I'm good. Subsequently, Black Coffee got that booking, and um, that was his first tour, and he's been pumping ever since. <laughs> so, so, oh man! But 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 the point that I'm, the point that the point that I'm making is that for a lot of people, things were good here, and so and South Africa is that place where, um, in one night. The, the people with the top songs in one night, they'll play eight gigs, you know? Oh yeah. I've definitely seen that. <laughs> like, especially right. in December here True. in Durban, it gets pretty crazy. And also the July is also one of those things. Like you always perform like 10 gigs in a day. Yeah. yeah. Missioning, missioning. Yeah. And so it just wasn't worth it for him at the time. But after that, then it became a big thing. And then a lot of people, ended up you know now it's like a normal thing and a big thing to go and like you say for a lot of people it became good opportunity from future sound you saw black coffees and future sound and you see what pops off from him you see people like nozinja the groom wave wasn't yeah. even you know yeah that became really big i know that was like in london and fucking italy and fucking france but, but, the, like, but the fuck up of it is that it's still a story of exploitation it's a story of some, yeah. There's some European dude who is using African resources to get paid and isn't paying out. <laughs> what's coming? What's coming into that record label account isn't coming out. And it can be argued, and it can be argued that it's just fifty pounds. You know, like, oh, Brad's just fifty pounds. Wow, wow, wow. But that's not the point. So have you heard a lot of stories like that or have you experienced anything like that? It's the standard. It's just normal. Really? Like, no one gets paid. No <laughs> one gets paid ever. Fuck, welcome to the music industry. Yeah. So is sad. that why you've had to do some of the shitty stuff that you said was like a bit soul destroying earlier? No, that's why people, that's why advances are such an exciting prospect because 
of the back, no one gets paid. It's like, yeah, let's rock, let's rock. And then it's excitement. And it's usually about the gigs, live shows is where a lot of money will come. But to trust other people's record labels to pay you is usually not a real thing. The point that I'm making is what happened with the groom thing, for example, is a bunch of young they say dudes come up with the maddest idea in the world and a ton of them um, connect with European labels. What ends up happening is that the European label owner ends up touring more than anybody on the label. <laughs> and it's just a global, like, um, global north border, you know, visa issue that they're not allowing people to travel as freely. Whereas that person can travel freely amongst their, you know, comrade states. Yeah, fuck, that actually is a really good point. I know that, yeah, that's been an issue for a lot of South African artists is just yeah. the fucking visa thing. And it, yeah, I America, mean, the, Europe, they can be very fucky with it. The visa thing is, is one side, but I mean, the really more, the more pragmatic side of it is just the ticket. That to go from oh uh, yeah to go from London and then travel all over the UK, you know, for some home uh, label head over there can do that versus somebody from here to do that mission takes more of an initial investment. Yeah, than some people than some people are able to make. But I mean, then you would say like you know it shouldn't be on the label to bring these people out and stuff like that. But I guess they're just not in. It's necessarily to entirely do that. Depending on the label, uh, of course. Yeah, I mean that that is usually the thing. But I'm talking about a how sustainable it is, and b that I actually see that the label brings out the people once or twice. But what ends up happening, really, because of what's most pragmatic, is that the label head ends up being like this curator figure and gets a shitload of gigs throughout the year in all territories, and ends up being like you know like really earning a lot. So they're getting the money directly into their account on one hand. On the other hand, they're playing all the gigs throughout the year as an impresario as opposed to the actual figures. Fuck. <laughs> I didn't even like really realize that or recognize that. Fuck. Like just it's just another story of fucking like music industry fuckery. But you like I was uh, gonna mention, you've got your own label, right? Yeah. But I mean just think about it more from the side of it's uh, like Persian flutes. You know what I mean? There's the guys in Persia. Who I don't the know. They make, they make the flutes. They play the flutes. They, you know what I mean? They, whatever, they're flute masters. But then there's the people all over the world who stand in the universities talking about the people in Persia playing the flutes. And obviously because they're in London already, it's easy for them to travel. So it's the same thing. With but how do we address our, it then? Our electronic music business. How do we address it? Because I mean, like I'm saying, like, I assume one of those things is you taking ownership over your own music. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of things. One side is our government should be supporting, should be supporting in one way. And there are programs where they do. And they are like some musicians who <laughs> take advantage. And some musicians who like go to the same conferences every year and get the funding every year. Yeah, that COVID funding. Yeah. Was no, but I mean that was that was that was needed and people, you know, like No, I just mean like it. some people got like millions and like yeah, there's you know, there were some discrepancies there between like people who could have really used it who didn't get and people who were probably fine without it, you know. But I know it's I know like enough people also did get, you know, it was, or was yeah. it just a mix? <laughs> I guess, yeah. We also are part of the um, SASM, the French Rights Distribution Organization. And they also did a COVID pandemic relief fund. And it's just based okay. on, yeah, that they get, they collect so many millions and millions that are untaken every year that they have to kind of disperse it, distribute it, redistribute Okay, and then what else can uh, we do to circumvent the exploitation from Europe and getting our artists? Like, is it just about focusing no, locally? It's about, it's, about, it's about education. It's about, it's about people not... Like, it's cheesy to say it's about education and it sounds like a bullshit story, but it's about people knowing... I guess we're so desperate an essay that if somebody offers anything we take it and that's the one yeah 
And I mean, that's somebody, even just locally with certain like labels and stuff. Yeah. If somebody says, you, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. You'll just take it and it's an opportunity and you never know what's going to come out of it. And that's how everybody's approaching it. So it's even hard to say. But it's just for us all to share information and, um, yeah, share resources. But there's definitely okay. ways to do it where you don't have to be the um, exploited lackey. But a, a big one is gatekeeping. People talk shit about gatekeeping, but there needs to be a certain degree of gatekeeping so that you see, don't... there's been I think there's been less of that these days because I see that basically with the media sometimes for myself, like. I struggle with local publications because there doesn't seem to necessarily be much quality control and like they're just writing about everything because the people will share it and get clicks and this and that. So like, so that's just from my perspective. Like I just sometimes like, yeah, we're just like a little quality control. Yeah. 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 For, for me, I mean more from the side of being able to control the scene from a home base, but in this, you know, hyper-connected digital world, the idea that you'll be able to block people from doing whatever the fuck they want is really ridiculous. So, yeah. No, I, I agree with you there. Yeah. Although, but I mean, what, I'm talking, be... what I'm talking about when I say gatekeepers in the terms of a new South African music scene is not to sell it, is not to sell it out, is to keep the rights of it. Yeah, is to keep the rights of it as much as possible. And to, if, if someone, um, some random Italian, whatever, offers you the label deal, is to compare mm. exactly what they can do versus what you could do of releasing it yourself. With platforms being there for you to release directly, like it's really to see what the worth is. Because the big fact is that, God forbid, you get hit by you know somebody's drone, airplane, and you're decapitated. Tomorrow, that Italian label owner is going to be taking your money for the next, you know, forty years. Yeah, and, that could and, be and not paying it to your family. Fam- and not yeah. paying it to your family. No, like I'm saying, I'm seeing it from like firsthand from homies who are essay producers of past who are working with a lot of reputable and underground foreign um, music organizations and. After their passing, you know, it's just been, yeah, zip. But yeah, it's just because nobody worry. wants nobody wants to count. Counting sucks. <laughs> I don't want to. I should do some accounting. Yeah, that's when you need someone you can actually trust doing that. But that can also be pretty hard to find sometimes. That's why the best. That's why I'm saying the best thing is for young people to at that point gatekeep and say, okay, maybe I should. We should do it as our own label, as opposed to giving it to someone else, so that. For the next 10 years of this massive song, instead of them needing to every three months give us statements and either tell the truth or lie, pay or not pay, we can just get paid directly. That's really actionable fucking advice. I reckon. (laughs) But then there's the the other side, man. There's the slickness, you know, there's graphic design, there's the, the, the... music videos, there's the bells. And yeah, but you'll usually like, find people that can do that for you in your local scene. Like if you're in a creative scene of sorts, if you're lucky enough to be in a like hub where there are other people creating, you can always create with the people around you, which I'm sure is something you've done. I mean, I know just from early on, you know, that's... Yeah, but let's, of- let's talk about, let's talk about uh, aesthetics and different aesthetics that appeal to different people. You know what I mean? The, yeah. Like I'm saying, this this South Af- this music shop that we used to buy CDs from was the maddest, weirdest covers, the jankiest, worst names. You know, like <laughs> DJ Cabbage, DJ Fork and Knife, like just just really bad by all by all things. But the the songs and, and some of the songs were were tragic as well. But <laughs> then you'd find gems in the same project as the really terrible music, you'd find gems in the same project. So it was like a great hunt. But the point that I'm making is it might not be the same look and feel that other people may be attracted to in foreign markets, and that's what they offer you. Sure. Contemporary tip design aesthetics that can appeal to Paris, <laughs> London, San Francisco, and Mumbai. <laughs> and Mumbai. <laughs> Uh, I see you've gotten some notes on your work before. 
<laughs> oh fuck it does like one of the things i wanted to actually talk to you about is how do you feel because you've actually seen like the evolution of music distribution basically you know from cds to soundcloud cassi mp3 and now the spotify Bandcamp era like what are your feelings on the state of digital distribution these days uh, like were you able to survive better before off of stuff or like you know is it better now able to survive jeez um you know what i mean i know you do all right <laughs> no it's that it's always sucked <laughs> okay. it's okay. always sucked no 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 that's not true <laughs> i think it's just about how how business oriented you are and how resourceful you are and what you want to do you know what i mean like if you're going to be someone who can sell t-shirts then no matter what's happening with digital distribution, you'll make a lot of money as as a merch person, as a design person, as a caps person, as a cups person. Um, sure. From from my side, yeah, it's just doing a whole bunch of other stuff, but it's also trying not to make music for money and trying to make music for 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 the other goals of making music and uh, sure. I don't know how we got into this avenue of the conversation. I think it's something you said about survive, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think you ever want to be making music to, I guess, yeah, sometimes it's hard not to make music until you can say, yeah, I make music. To, I'll die if I didn't make music. I make music to survive. I'll die if I didn't make music. But I mean, yeah, I don't really know. Well, yeah, I was just wondering, like, I mean, that does bring up a whole different aspect of it, but yeah, just the, like, do you think you're able to reach more people now, like through stuff like Spotify, or is it just like fucking you guys over? Some of the, sorry to backtrack into other interesting conversation that has to do Please. with what you're talking about now, but also what you're talking about earlier about that point in future sound of and people being recognized internationally and YouTube, yeah, and the old YouTube. You know, like yeah, the, the old um, 2006 YouTube. You can actually find new stuff. Yeah. On one side, find new stuff, but on the other side, also find everything to do with what you're looking at. Into. Oh, as opposed, yeah. As opposed to being fully misdirected just due to someone paying. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's, it's just a different place, a different feel. And yeah. um, a lot of, from DJ Mochava to Nozzi, DJ Spoko, DJ Call Me, Black Coffee, like, YouTube, more than Apple Music, more than Spotify, YouTube was the one, and Spook My Tambo, YouTube was the one that broke you know, for a lot of us. Again, these days? Shit, that was nostalgia. That was a long time ago. Yo, that's like <laughs> 20 years ago now. Whoa, 2006 <laughs> is 20 years ago. Whoa. Almost. 18, yeah. yeah. Whoa. Don't, like, okay, don't okay. remind me. Okay, Just don't okay. remind me, man. Okay, like, so, I'm, I'm having my own existential crises about getting older, so I don't need to know that. <laughs> you need to embrace it. You need to embrace it. No, now, um, yeah, things are good, man. I'm, I'm stoked that the kids, not the kids. <laughs> I'm stoked that the people who want to release stuff and can release stuff at a high quality. I mean, even quality, the idea of quality is bullshit. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm just excited that people have the, the space to release music. It really miffs me out that, you know, like they may earn absolutely nothing off it. But like I say, you may not need to or want to earn off your music. But the idea that it'll live on this big digital farm and the Swedish tech lord will earn quadrillions. You know what I mean? And you'll only be paid yeah. after the 1,000th play. When a lot of, like if we say micro scene stuff, may live in the hundreds of plays, and that scene may be working in those hundreds of plays, but before the 1,000 won't earn anything. And this is yeah. amongst, and that's like, would they say like 80 or 80% of Spotify or something like that is below that thousand play. Yeah, it's fucking it's ridiculous. Just a way, so it's just a way to pay no one. So as far as how do I feel about today and all of that, 
think it's sad. But I think people need to be resourceful. I think you still need to make beautiful stuff. You need to offer people things that they want. You need to be useful in people's lives. I don't know. Cool. Um, you're also someone who has collaborated a hell of a lot, like a large like number of your portions from like from the Fantastic Kill to Sweatex to the stuff you did with Xabot to Phantasma to the Lolly Boy stuff now. What is the key to being able to, you know, collaborate successfully? Mm. Well, I guess what's the definition of collaborating successfully? <laughs> <laughs> Creating dope <laughs> shit, I guess, because, yeah, I'm sure there's probably been a few okay. issues behind yeah. the scenes. <laughs> yeah, creating dope stuff is is the, is the definitely the, the goal. And I'd say in a lot of the groups that you mentioned from... But do to oh, yes, fantastic we're about. kill phantasma like the lally boy stuff it's a lot of like friendship and some of it may just be really temporary you know maybe someone that i'm hanging out with a lot for a year two years or three years or six months or just hang out with someone for a couple of months and out of that friendship and closeness is the ability to come up with you know uh, dope uh, stuff. Okay. Yeah, uh, so that was that was the question now about how how to collaborate. I'd say it's yeah. from a closeness of friendship. But... <laughs> so well, then I mean, I guess we can take it all the way back to when you were studying medicine in Cape Town. How did you come to be in the music scene there, and how did you meet Wadi and Sabot, and you know, do fucking the Fantastic Kill, which is you know, arguably quite a legendary album in South African music history. I guess at that point you wouldn't, I wouldn't have said I was in the music scene. I would have said I'm in the hip hop scene. Okay. And, and the hip hop scene consisted of you know, a very thriving, crazy uh, graffiti scene, mad b-boy scene, a scratch DJ scene that Cybot was a big part of and champion at the African hip hop and Dawa battles. Sabot was like a big deal in Scratch DJ. And he was also part of um, a crew called EM, Evil Minds, with um used to write Void. So I was I was really a big yeah, a big hip hop corp on one side and on the other side a publisher and a journalist. And I started a magazine called Levitation Magazine when I was in high school. Oh, dope. The magazine ended up uh, working collaboration with that club, Reality, Reality, Insanity, and the clothing brand, White Trash. Then later on... Oh, yeah. We, then later on worked with Faith, Faith 47, the graffiti artist, who was the yeah, designer. Yeah. And um, yeah, we were housemates. So then got deeper in the graffiti world, being around her. Um, Mac One was her partner at the time. Wheels is um, her son, Kia's father. So just being around when Wheels and Simon were, and Cybot were also in the crew together. So just being in a really creative hip hop space of illustrators, artists, dancers and writers and being a writer being a journalist being a publisher being you know super passionate i'd say that's how i came in but, um so cybot how did i meet Sai? Uh, it was through we were in high school together oh we wow yeah yeah we were where was that together. we were at st john's college together oh, okay yeah, we were in high school together, and when I was in standard six, he was in matric, I think. So I would lie, but we were different houses, and I would lie. He was in the line, you know, he was in the last line of his house. I was in the first line of my house, so we stood kind of relatively close together, but no relation. And then I made friends with his brother, and uh, we met, but it was only later on through the magazine and my, you know, intense nerdy interest that we met. And then even later when I told him about my ideas and my weird kind of concepts and ideas. Because you had also had been me. rapping at home and stuff before that, right? 
you, not just at home. Like, uh, oh, you've I'd been had, about. I had, had a show. Yeah, yeah, I did a gig. So there was a gig called Liquid Fusion at a venue called Horror Cafe, and I had a whole bunch of Josie acts, the DJC live, and a whole bunch of local acts. Okay. So I rhymed there, but it was rhyming out, but the occasional cipher, and yeah, trying to be as much in the community as possible whilst being like you saw from the TED talk being like really isolated I was also trying to be as much in the community as possible and that at that point that meant you know phoning people hi is um is, is Tabo home no Tabo's gonna be back later Who's, who should I say is called Tato um, Tato um, don't, don't worry I'll call it you know so I'm like 50 it's trying to get these hip hop heads. <laughs> so then, Fantastic Kill through Psy, I, I was I was working on just mad concept, and that was the same thing with Fantastic Kill. It was a kind of concept yeah. project. That's what we that's what we linked up on. Just trying to make a really interesting conceptual hip hop story. Was it like working with by, Wadi and Psy at the time. It was really exciting. I, think, I guess we're forgetting to say that this is after they released the seminal Constructors Corporation. Constructors, album. yeah, yeah. Which is, which yeah. Was you can find so it on YouTube. Good, which is very, very great. Juicy it was like a whole comic stuff. book, like as a yeah. album kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So you had already heard that. You're already into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, before that, when we were maybe in grade nine or grade 10 or whatever, the, that um, Deltron 3030 came out. There's like, then I heard that Genesis album, uh, the carpet crawlers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then I was like, oh shit. Then I was listening to a lot of like Buck 65, just the, yeah, just big story based conceptual hip hop. So that was my big excitement and my big interest in working with him. And then how did that influence your career? Do you think it's had an impact or like, because I mean, for me, that's just where like I found you the first time. So like, I've always wondered how it was for you. What? <laughs> I mean, like, how did that affect your career? Did it like help you like, get more people? Like, being on the Fantastic Kill? Oh, um... um yeah, I mean, we do some shows, did shows, um, did shows in different parts of the country. And because he had so much notoriety and he's this white guy in South Africa, him bringing on a young black MC for even black people and black MCs is interesting. For some Joburg people who knew me but didn't knew I rhymed, it was, uh, Trippy, yeah, it was just a really interesting, great, weird part of life. I was, I was young. I can't, <laughs> yeah, super young and stoked. Felt just really exciting to do something, to do something fun, to do something exciting, to do something different. I mean, I guess that's kind of always been your your motto, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, even something like Phantasma was, like, just way different to, like, anything else I'd ever heard before. Yeah, exactly. So when you ask what what did that fantastic kill bring, I think it's that, you know, to keep doing really fun stuff, keep doing really different stuff. Just, yeah. Sure. Yeah, how do you feel about uh, Pussy on My Mind at this uh, point in your career <laughs> with Sweet X? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, feel, 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 feel good. Feel good. Yeah, feel, I mean, that song good. fucking bangs, dude. Like, I'm not gonna lie. I, think, I think all of that, all of that Sweet X really, really bangs. And is was released on vinyl but was never really digitally released yeah it was on uh, myspace for a bit and i don't know how i've got a copy but i've got So it's like really obscure but it's weird and it's loud and it's obnoxious yeah (laughs) 
<laughs> but yeah, then Phantasma was like completely different. Um, and that, like I felt, was like such, I don't know, like I just thought like it was a fucking beautiful project. How did that come about? Because like you brought together quite a few different people, like very different artists together, and you still managed to create this really coherent sound. Uh, yeah, they are. How did it come about? Future Sound of Mzanzi documentary that I made. Okay. And I was talking about being super, I guess, from teenage journalist, music journalist, and the magazine that yeah. then went into making music documentaries. And subsequently, when I was making a lot of electronic music and my interest and in was DJing a lot, I wanted to make this documentary to meet some of the people whose music I was playing. Oh, Later dog. on, uh, made a music, made a documentary about Vugas Tate, uh, who is in Phantasma. So that's yeah. another person. Uh, I'd met him through, there's a lecturer from the University of Wazulu, music department called Sazi Lamin. And Sazi Lamin told us about uh, Tambolin, Vugas Tate, the extent of that. Who played guitar, bass, violin, harmonica in Phantasma. And so that's two of the Brasa. Um, that Spoko as well was in the documentary. And I wondered if that's when you had met him. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. That's the spiel that I'm giving that. For Spoko, it was through the documentary. For Big, it was through another documentary. So it was basically just picking up and meeting these crazy Avengers from these different, completely different parts of the music world. You know, one a Maskandi master from back in the day, old school, and another bra who is old school in his own way, mm-hmm. but has been through so much. Like Spoko was with Nozinja making the Shangan disco. So Spoko mm-hmm. was behind the Shangan disco. Spoko was with Mojava making Township Funk. So Spoko was behind Township Funk. Spoko produced... They did a version of Sister Bettina is made with like like a Fruity Loops preset that's given oh, to wow. you. That did, 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 did like an Aaliyah sample. So a lot of people had done versions. So they had a version of it that's supposedly before Sister Bettina and is a popular township like uh, home, home song. Um, just um, Spoko is being through you know enough team. Andre can't for the life of me remember how <laughs> I met Andre, but hey, Shred. yeah, I can't remember how I met Andre. And yeah, we became we became really crazy close, discordant, messy family. <laughs> we became we became yeah the odd the odd the odd brothers. <laughs> yeah, because it's quite a varied collective. So it was in terms of collaboration. I mustn't, I mustn't forget about Leviticus, Leviticus Buchanan on the drums. Mike, oh, yes. Mike Buchanan on the drums. Yeah. He was an absolute nut. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, that's the thing. It sounds like you got together quite a few characters. Because I know even Andre and Spoko, are like you know, it can be a little wild. Yeah. I mean, what was that process actually like making music with those people? It was, it was fun. It was fun. It was really fun. It's really fun to have that brotherhood. The chaos of it is kind of like we complain about apartheid and segregation and white supremacy and the rules, but something like Andre and Beggy tuning together yeah. the guitars. There's like an inherent, you know, cultural, musical disconnect, you know, there's a anthropological disconnect of what the guitar is. There's a tuning disconnect and them together is like this thing that, you know, on one level, should it work? It's difficult to work and we say we want to break it down. (laughs) So it gets messy trying to break it down and we try to break it down. I mean, that was honestly such a dope project. So I don't know if I ever like mentioned that weirdly enough, when you guys played at Opie Copy, I chatted to Cat Power for like ages beforehand. Just luckily she wanted to chat to me and she asked like, who should she watch? And I was like, ah, you need to check Phantasma out. 
And literally, whilst I'm watching you guys, she comes and stands next to me and like, what you said and was like really into it. And I was just like, mm-hmm. yeah, I was quite proud. Actually, <laughs> I was like, mm-hmm. fuck yeah. So I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah, like it was one of those yeah. things where like, oh, no, that's no, that's good. That's a true ball. That's a true ball. Thank you for telling Cat Power, man. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. I mean, you guys were. I'd only heard um, "Once You Love," I think, and yeah. But I mean, I'd known your work, and I was like, yeah, fuck, I need to check these guys out. So that Opie copy, and then thankfully, like, well, luckily, yeah. Like, sorry for putting you in B and B when you played that gig for me in Durban. <laughs> I've been meaning no, to apologize for years, but we didn't have much budget. <laughs> no, it's all good. And yeah, thanks for doing that. Like, because that to me was still crazy. Like that you guys were willing to come and play like a pub gig in Durban for very little money. Yeah, yeah. No, we were really, we we're really pushing at that point, and you know, it's it's trying to get fully grown men across the country can be a really arduous <laughs> task. <laughs> yeah being a band um, is quite a mission yeah yeah but uh, even like older dudes can be even more of a mission oh yeah hard to yeah, get a hold of like, yeah no it's just like uh, it's a lot it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot but yeah that's all the part of collaboration I guess and like you yeah. said there's the Money Boy project which came out in the last couple of years and that's from just was a hanging out yeah, how did that come about? I mean, I wanted to get into Batuk first, but we'll talk Lolly Boy, and then if we can quickly talk Batuk, and then you can go. <laughs> eh, Lali, Lali Boy is like a Kasa MC, vocalist, trumpeter, guitarist from Butterworth. On one side, on the other side, from Fos Loras. So it was like very township, Jersey raised. And then on the other side, very rural. You know, Lali means okay. um, village. So Lali boy is like village boy. Village boy. Okay. Well, like rural boy. So he, I was involved in, do you ever hear about that Damon Alburn oh, That African project Africa thing. Express. Yeah. African Express. Yeah. Yeah. I knew Muzi was on that as well. Yeah. So there was the South African Africa Express. I had done Africa Express in Spain and in the UK and in Norway before that. Not in Norway, in Denmark. In Denmark before that. And it was a mixed, different kind of experiences. You know? Some of them were like a nightmare experience, like the worst <laughs> day. The worst day ever, like nightmare day, like nothing can get you know, and then some of them were very, very awesome and the best weeks of my life that I'll cherish forever and love forever. And um, kept relationships with the Africa Express people. But when they came through, I wasn't able to be a part of what they're planning. But I was, we had done, I had done a lot of business with Africa Express team, had um, their management team was managing my career at some point. So I was really connected to them. So it was linking them with different artists. And through that linked uh, Radio One Two Three, which Lally Boy is a part of. Okay, I didn't yeah. realize. That. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Then there was a track that, in passing, at that point, Spoko was really ill, and I was helping him do hospital runs. He was a part of the music program. I wasn't, and I was just there for the purpose of picking him up, taking him to the hospital, bringing him back. You know, like do the hospital okay. runs. And um, ultimately, I rhymed on one track just from these popping in, popping out, popping in, popping out. Then some, it was Cybot making beats. So, like an old homie, then a Lally Boy was also on that track. So, from there, we linked up, kept chatting. He heard some tracks that I had done myself. And he was like, whoa, he really wants to feature on them. So Nomzama was the first one he featured on, and then Emonti. Then they're like really like my mom is Tasa, my grandmom, I was raised by a Tasa woman, really, you know. Okay. So I have that real um, cultural soft spot, cultural sweet spot. So I was making these kind of 
wonky beats using either choral kasa sounds or traditional sounds, um, group sounds, really raw sounds, but putting them against quite um, shiny electronic synthy synthy bits. And yeah, I was doing that just for my own personal pleasure. When he heard that, he was off to the races, and that was kind of the first Lally Boy project. So when you guys Since, have collaborated yeah. quite a bit, and like what keeps that going? I think we're, we're trying to excavate some history. We're trying to make some some new possibilities. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of things that have been left on the ground. When I say left on the ground, I mean there's a lot of tricks that haven't been done. You know what I mean? There's there's a lot of magic tricks okay. that still haven't been explored. There's just a lot of like we've got an old hip hop tradition in South Africa, right? Like from the eighties, sure. from you know, some people trace the early eighties, the mid eighties, the late eighties, but we've got like an old hip hop tradition that had come through various different sounds. But as much as global hip hop has beat making has evolved to incorporate different local elements, we still haven't caught up fully with that. Do you know what I mean? As far as everything so, that, uh, let's say, UK has done, that, say, America has done, and just A for A, B for B, C for C, as far as, like, use of gospel music, use of uh, traditional chants, use of sports themes, use of jazz. South Africa's got a deep, long jazz tradition, like a very, very deep jazz tradition that is also yeah. very vibrant today. But that trick still hasn't really been caught as far as South African beat makers. So um, there's a lot that's been left on the floor. So uh, when you say what keeps it going, I think it's to pick up and do some stuff that just hasn't been done enough to my satisfaction that I want to hear. I dig to hear it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I have noticed you do like to basically put your own spin on you know, South Africans, South Africa's past, basically. Like, I know you had, like, that period where you did quite a bit of 80s, like, remixes. I think you put out a whole mixtape of it, which, like, is that, I guess, since your 20s, once you realized shit was happening no, at home, that's when it all started, right? No, it's not, it's not even that. I think it's long before that. Oh, I mean, really? The whole, idea, the whole idea of Spook My Tambo is a story that I wrote when I was 13, 14, for like an English assignment. And it was about a little teenage boy in the 1940s in Sophia Town who is bullied, who's left alone by his dad, is bullied by other kids and plays the trumpet and ends up burning in a fire. And it becomes oh, sure. this other fantastical, you know, end to the story which is what happens. It's like this glorious fire dream that he has as he burns to death is like a fantastical end to the story. So my interest in South Africa's past is really like uh, from a long time ago and it's from the thing of like time travel. I used to have this dream when I was like the biggest recurring dream I'd have when I was really small was about time travel. And with South Africa, time traveling is always like a precarious idea. You know? There is no, there is no real like um, sure. good old days. But, yeah, but I think the time traveling thing actually fully like makes me understand your music so much better now. Like that's a great way to describe like your yeah how you create music. It does feel like time travel, both like to the past yeah. and you know the future. Yeah, and that was just a constant dream that I would have and would end up in different places and it would have different kind of um, repercussions. Some of them funny, some of them like nightmares, like some of them really tragic and some of them would have to do with, you know, what I'm learning about in history class at school or whatever. But that's what I think hip hop is. I think it's a technology for time travel. I think it's, it's a way of using sound to move across time and to give 
a feeling to use like um, old resonance, things that have been captured before, and to mash them together to give new feelings, but using the old energy. I think it's a really a fascinating form. And when I say like trick, magic trick or technology, I think it's very fascinating for that specific thing that you can like go to the 20s or you can go to you know, 2018. You know, then it's usually quite very specific. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, I feel you there, man. Uh, I do want to try cl- around this off. Do you have a couple more minutes to chat a bit about Batuk and how you met yes. Carla and how that all came about? <laughs> awesome, because I, I figured you might. Yeah, so how did you guys meet? How did that all come about? Because, yeah, it's quite a quite a relationship you guys have, like both like creatively and everything else. Well, how did we meet? This is kind of contested. We can't now agree. <laughs> I, I had one idea on how we met, but a couple of days ago she just ripped it all apart. So I'm now I'm not sure on how we met. <laughs> well, how do you remember it? Yeah. I'll eventually chat to her and get I her side of the story. A house party, really long time ago. I remember a friend of mine, Muntler, was in a bar. I remember being in an observatory in Cape Town. And I might remember a trucker cap or two being around. Like, yeah, <laughs> but she says... The Von Dutch era. She says she wasn't finished high school in that time, so it's very it's very confusing. I don't know. So um, we met again in Mozambique, and we just yeah, became fast friends. And she's always had an interest in music, electronic music, house music. So we just kind of linked up on that. I think she's got a interesting tone, interesting way of writing. But what I saw was a play that she did. That she's a she's a theater maker. She's a performer. She's a director. She's a producer. So I went to see a two woman play that she did in Joburg at. Damn, I can't remember anything today. At um, some theater in Maboning, but the whole thing with it was you'd mission around. You wouldn't sit down. It wasn't a sitting down play. <laughs> like they'd do different parts of the play and you'd mission around and follow them and they'd be running. So it was like really active, weird, interactive, interesting okay. play. And it was just the two of them, but it was really And she hadn't told me like, oh, come see my play. Oh, oh, oh. She was just like, hey, Come through tonight. Come through tonight. Almost like I'm coming with her to see a play. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And it ended up being like this crazy experience. So I was like, wow, she's a, she's a really um, great performer. And yeah, we should do music together. So since then, we've made a lot of films together. We're working on a film project together right now. We've done a lot of music together. But Duke came out. Yeah, she was in Surf Sangoma. She was in the Kizazi Moto animation as Mlindos, the, the gangster, the go-to gangster. Yeah. What's, okay, so what's it like creating with someone who, you know, you care about, <laughs> like, where you're dating? And, like, does it come, does it create, like, any tensions? Or has the process for you guys been just, you know, ideas come easily? Like, you can finish each other's sentences kind of thing? Or is it a mix? Um, working with my... My wife, my friend, but somebody also who is a creative that I respect and that inspires me, genuinely inspires me, has cool ideas. And intellectually, like, you know, like I respect and look up to. It's really, it's really fun. Yeah, Yeah, it's really fun. There's obviously um, a lot of tension, but I think the biggest thing about it is that I learn about myself, like with, with working with other people, I can, a lot of relationships with other people end invariably. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? Or stop or what, what, what. But with my wife, I'm with her all the time. And so there's no, there's no, <laughs> there's no kind of stop. So I have to face the thing and look at, okay, what is it? And a lot of the time I'm like, oh, in fact, that's actually you. Whereas with other people, I can kind of run away from it and blame and, Point the finger. Because <laughs> when you're forced to really just stick and look, it's like, oh, it's actually you. Put your shit together. Do better. Yeah, but how? How is it? 
Yep, it's um, inspiring. It's exciting. It really, it really pushes. It's really cool also because there's all the stuff I'm talking about is kind of like go hang, like yeah, we're working together, working together. But there's also things like fear, insecurity, um, like just like being really. Well, that's the thing about creative projects in general. So being so close to someone, I imagine, no, can sometimes highlight so that. And what I wanted to be, say was yeah. having somebody who really cares about you and um, is quite intimately expert at making you feel better. You know what I mean? So there's some things where it's like you have an irrational fear of doing something and you should really do it and professionally you should do it, creatively you should do it, but you just have this irrational childish fear. But to have somebody that you're really, really close with to be like, calm down, it's going to be fine, you're going to be great, like, let's go. <laughs> that also helps. Like, yeah, that actually, yeah, sounds pretty dope. Yeah, there's lots of times when I would have, I'm happy just like, yeah, you know, if I was just doing it not like that, it'd just be like, yeah, fine. Yeah, because I can also see there's obviously been a maturity to your work and approach as you guys have been together. So it's cool to see. <laughs> Great. But like we, like we say, we just calculated 20 years, you know, and well, yeah, well, it's 20 years, 2004. But if we say 2006, by 2006, fantastic kill already felt like a, a while ago but you were always busy that's why like you've literally just constantly been creative as long as i've seen like i don't know how you maintain like such a constant flow i think it's that thing that i'll say that i think there's a lot of stuff that still needs to get done that i still don't see other people really doing to be honest with you okay so until that happens it's like all on your shoulders yeah like, like for real, like the whole Future Side of Anzante documentary thing, they, they weren't the documentaries coming out at the point. And then after that, there was a whole big flood of them. <laughs> and really rad ones, yeah. rad ones <laughs> came out of, you know, what I mean? that flood. But it was an important thing to do. No, I mean, it put me onto a ton of stuff I did on Noe. So thanks for doing that. <laughs> like it was genuinely educational. And even to this day, I think it's something people can still learn a lot from yeah okay i'm gonna ask you one last question i'll ask everyone and then you can get going it's uh, quite simple what is a big mistake you've learned an important lesson from big mistake i've learned an important lesson from i guess i've got kind of two that are lurking in my mind the big one is definitely to read 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 what you're signing <laughs> read for Read. Okay. <laughs> so you were talking from experience earlier. <laughs> With regards to what? Uh, just the European labels and yeah, signing music over yeah. to other people. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I mean, I got screwed over. I got screwed over coming in really gung ho, really like enthusiastic, really creative, really resourceful. You know. And as far as being able to record music, mix music, pro get music produced, uh, write the music, um, do music videos, edit the music videos, pay for everything and just doing it. And having a label um, trick me into... Uh, yeah, so that's where it should cut out. It was just a little section of the interview. But um, I'm, I'm annoyed. I'm obviously bummed that you guys don't get to hear the full context there or the full thing. But basically what he was saying was he was, yeah, he put out dope shit that he paid for. And then a label picked him up, a label that he respected and thought was dope. I mean, they even had Frankie Knuckles uh, on the label. And they basically screwed him over by signing him and then putting all the costs on him to do it again, to, you know, create shit again, to do another music video, everything like that. Um, he had to pay for that them himself whilst they profited off of it. So, yeah, <laughs> that's 
we kind of spoke about it earlier in the podcast you know it's important if you're a musician to own your stuff as much as you can i'm sure any taylor swift fan uh, probably knows that at this point but yeah man it's crazy how the music industry works i think paramore even just got out of their record deal like i think i, I think it was for uh six albums or whatever but it was about 20 years they signed a 14 year old girl i think she was 14 Haley williams when she signed to basically a 20 year fucking contract so yeah you got to be careful man like people will offer you a lot people will promise you a lot I even though in stand-up comedy like even with a lot of the you know show max or the netflix stuff it's not like people are getting a ton of money on the back end there and a lot of the time they're not even getting a lot of money on the front end you know we're all being sold this whole thing of exposure and you know being able to be seen by more people which you know it can have a positive effect but also if you're being seen by the wrong people uh it won't so i don't know man it's all a fucking mess and it's a lot of shit you're gonna have to figure out in yourself as an artist as to how much you want to work with labels and stuff like that because they're not entirely bad you know they do offer some like you know spook i think said after this or he said it maybe earlier in the podcast you know they do offer you certain aspects they do offer you promotion some you know labels are actually quite good in terms of like you know getting you to tour and all of those things but also like he said a lot of the time they just uh, keep that money and lie to you about what's been sold or how many streams you've gotten and all of that thing so i guess at the end of the day you just gotta stay woke uh yeah so that was the podcast man that was spoke matambo and tato mojata and uh yeah i hope you hope you got as much out of that as i did so what's been happening uh this week very little i'm still on my no drinking thing it's been pretty good although also you know having to like i mentioned in the past having to like really stare into the void sometimes i can be a little painful but i think I think I'll come through all of it stronger. And yeah, it's been a very chilled week. I watched Gen V. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's uh, the boys spin-off. It's pretty fucking dope. It's also like pretty cringe at times. Some of it is a little ham-fisted. But for the most part, like yeah, it's a murder mystery. Well, not quite a murder mystery, but it's a, it's a mystery. And a bit of a different take to the boys where like you know in the boys everyone's corrupted everyone's a bad guy even the good guys are bad guys but here there's a lot more of a moral quandary and it's people trying to do good and you know the world and discovering that the world is a dark fucking place as a yeah they (laughs) come to grips with the the mystery so if you dig the boys i highly recommend it it's basically like the boys meet sex education i'd say even though i haven't watched a lot of sex education it just uh it's giving it's giving sex education (laughs) so i checked that out and other than that i've just been trying to spend most of my time writing as much as i can although you know try as the operative word there Uh, a few nights have uh, been have just disappeared whilst playing gta online which i know i'm about 10 years late for but it's been fun just rolling around doing some missions and yeah letting go for a while but i'm also i'm in my getting shit done phase or at least like trying to just build a better future phase and so i'm trying to just spend more time writing things i've got i've got so many different unfinished fucking things that yeah this year i really want to just do it and who knows what the end outcome of all of it will be i know like for myself personally like you know sometimes i get a little insecure and that makes it harder to sit down and write and it makes it harder to try and make shit better because i'm just like oh you know you're never gonna be good enough and all of that shit but you gotta well i gotta at least work on that negative self-talk and i and i've been trying you know like i'm a pretty capable dude 
I've written some pretty dope shits in the past, I've written some pretty good jokes, and I'm sure there's a few more on the way. It is just a matter of persevering through the, the pain of the blank page, or even worse, I think. Like, some people will disagree, because, you know, the beauty's in the edits or whatever, but every now and again, uh, editing shit that I've written, and just going, wow, you really wrote that, huh? Damn, you're not very good at this. But once again, got to work on that negative self-talk. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trying, man. I'm fucking trying. And uh, I guess that's all we can do. But I did have a dope chat so last week, Friday, actually, whilst I was putting out the podcast uh, with my friend Neil Green, the comedian. You, you probably, you've probably heard of him. And uh, yeah, we... We had a really great chat. He gave me a lot of motivation and just reminded me that, yeah, being able to do a thing like this for five years, even before that, something like Durban is yours for like nine years. And like, yeah, you know, they might not be big money earners or these things that are majorly successful, but there is something to it, man, to persevere, to continue to just do the thing that you want to do regardless of the money. Which I think is something that Spook even, you know, would uh, agree with there. And then also, you know, without necessarily all the public adoration that other people get. But it's funny because like, I often see myself as someone who doesn't do enough. And I think that is true. Like I do. I think I can do way more than I do. <laughs> but hey, I've also done quite a lot. Like and been relatively consistent. But the reality is, a lot of the time, what you've done, you know, that don't mean shit, yo. Like, it's dope that you've done that, but life's moving forwards. It's, it's not, uh, you don't live it looking backwards, basically. And if you do, I think you'll miss out on a lot of stuff. So it is about just continually looking forward and going, what do I really want to fucking do? And a lot of the time, I actually have the capacity to do it. You know, I have a few hours at night and I remember Neil Gaiman even saying that he wrote Coraline 50, 50 words a night. So if I can, if I can do that, <laughs> I think, I think in the long term, you know, if I build things brick by brick, I'll have a few houses at the end of all of it, or at least nice walls. I think that's I'm just gonna build walls in the middle of fucking nowhere. And uh, yeah, that could be an art project coming soon to nowhere near you and that brings us to the end of the podcast which means it's time to shout out the titular titles tier over at patreon.com forward slash almost perfect now if you don't know uh, over at patreon.com forward slash almost perfect there is a tier it's called the titular titles tier it is the top tier and it is ten dollars and at this tier you get to pick your title and i shout you out also, you can subscribe to the $1 level or the $5 level, and I'll shout you out the week that you do that. Uh, there are benefits and stuff, but in general, I think most of the people who support the Patreon just do it to support the podcast. Like, I've put out stuff on Patreon, and it just doesn't seem like the patrons actually care or need it. But uh, this, is, this is one of the benefits if you are at the $10 level. And it's, uh, yeah, genuinely though, I do want to say a big thank you to everyone who has ever signed up to the Patreon at any level uh, for any amount of time. Like, there's been people who've swung me a couple bucks, there've been people who have literally put thousands of rands into this podcast as time's gone on. And that will forever blow my fucking mind and i will forever be grateful to you guys for that so seriously thank you very much and uh yeah shout out to Rousseau, the storage clerk of subtle heresies in the lesser overberg region Rousseau also like reached out to me earlier this week let me know about a horror philosophy book which i'm pretty keen to check out and yeah if you want to get in touch with me you can obviously do that through patreon or you can just hit me up bob at almost perfect.co.za i'm always keen to hear feedback i'm always keen to have you know discussions like i don't want this just be a one-way thing 
So please hit me up, barbaralmostperfect.co.za. Let me know your thoughts and feelings and opinions. And uh, yeah, I probably will get back to you. I've gotten better at that than earlier on in my life. Uh, shout outs to Russell Grant, the Far East correspondent. Shout outs to Neil Green, the key grip. Uh, shout outs to Kron Chetty, the assistant to the regional manager. Shout outs to Kat Jenkins, the endeavor ruler of the universe and Queen Swifty. And shout outs to Stephen Olafia, the executive producer. Of course, I want to give a big thank you to Damien Root for the bed music you hear underneath me. Yes, that's called bed music. And I learned that when I was on radio. <laughs> Uh, also, a big thank you to him for the banging fucking intro you hear at the start of every single episode. And uh, lastly, but certainly not leastly, shout out to you. Uh, I will catch you on the flip side. <laughs>